much. Um, thank you, NIJ, for inviting me. And I've got my watch here kind of sideways, so I'll start turning my head. Well, it is cold in Florida. I was really hoping to get a tan and come home and make everybody jealous, but it's not going to happen. And um, I do want to forewarn you that I have not properly jacked myself up on caffeine yet. So usually by now I've got at least 16 ounces and I haven't even gotten eight in. So that's totally my fault. I got up six minutes before I was supposed to be here. So it's crazy. Um, but thank you very much for having me here. This is um, an incredible opportunity for Ronald and myself. And um, who would have ever thought that I would be standing at NIJ conference. Not only did I not know what NIJ was, um, I certainly didn't think I had anything to share with you all um, many years ago. And of course, they say in a journey, it's not the destination that matters, it's, it's the journey along the way. And this journey I've been on has been incredible. And I feel very blessed that truly I have been the one to um, be able to bring it to people such as yourselves that are interested in, um, in justice. So again, thank you for having me. Um, my journey takes place and starts a long time ago in 1984 as a college student in a small, small college town called Elon, um, which is right beside Burlington, which is this massive city in comparison to Elon. And I was living in an apartment. I was um, a single student, 22 years old, was working two jobs and um, going to school and making a 4.0 and was engaged to um, a, a student at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And so finally I felt by the age of 22, I, I had my, my path, I knew where I was headed, I was really proud of the choices I was making and, um, and so life was really quite good for me the summer of 1984. In July, um, for those of you who are lucky enough to be in North Carolina in July, it's extraordinarily hot and humid. This particular July day was just horrifically hot and humid. And I had gone out to play tennis with my fiance and um, showered, we had gone out to dinner, I'd um, eaten an incredible amount of Chinese food, which I'm known to eat an incredible amount of food anyway, but I, really ate a lot of Chinese food this night and came down with an, a, a massive MSG overdose. And um, my head was hurting, so I had asked my fiance to take me home. I needed to go to bed early, and that's what he did. And my last memory on July 28th of 1984 was of him standing over me, making sure that I had indeed gone to sleep and, and I was okay. So somewhere around three o'clock in the morning of July 29th, I remember feeling as if there was a presence in my room. I remember waking up to a, a sound that I thought was someone in my room. And I'm not sure how many of you ladies out there have had those experiences, but I've come to know that most women have this, where we feel like there's someone in the room and you're not sure if you're dreaming it or if it's actually happening. And so certainly as I was experiencing this, this presence, I decided that there was no one in the room, I would go back to sleep because the option was terrifying. At that moment, I felt something brush against my arm and I could no longer ignore that there was a presence in my room. And I remember looking to the left side of my bed to see someone's head kind of crouched and sliding beside of it. Things happen quickly in these moments. You. Um, come up with something that is palatable. So certainly this had to have been my fiance who had fallen asleep, making sure that I was safe and he was quietly leaving my apartment to go home. And I thought that's not possible. I, his mother was um, very domineering, needed to know where he was at all moments of the day and so he would not have been in my apartment at three o'clock in the morning. So I then said out loud, who is that, who's there? And at that second, a man jumped up and um, straddled my body and put a knife to my throat. And as I screamed, he muffled my mouth with a gloved hand. And again, thoughts are going through your head very rapidly. This cannot be happening to me. Surely I know this person and this has got to be some incredibly sick joke. And as I strained through 
the light coming through my window, I realized I didn't know this person, I didn't recognize him, and I was in a lot of trouble. He's broken in to rob me. That has to be it. He's broken in to rob me. I'll offer him everything I have. He can have my car, my credit cards, my checkbook, any cash I have. It doesn't matter. Just don't hurt me, and I promise I won't call the police. And he looked at me and he said, I don't want your money. And at that moment, I knew. I knew what was going to happen to me. I didn't know if he would simply rape me and leave, or if he would rape me and beat me, or if he would rape me and kill me. These were my options. I remember very quickly praying that somehow I'd have the presence of mind to survive this, that somehow my mother and father would not be at the morgue within hours to identify my body, that somehow my face wouldn't be permanently scarred for the rest of my life. And I remember thinking to myself, think, Jennifer, think, how are you going to get through this? I know. I'll reach for the lamp, and I'll hit him on the head, and I'll knock him out, and I'll call the police, and I'll be safe. But I'm on my back, and there's a knife to my throat. I'm five foot one. At that time, I, I may have weighed 105 pounds. I'd never been in a fight in my life. I, I had no idea how to physically defend myself. And I would make a guess this was probably not the first time he had done this. I knew he was under the influence of alcohol. I could smell it. I didn't know if he was under the influence of narcotics, and I wasn't going to tempt fate at this moment. A week before, my sister and I had taken a walk around the lake near Elon. She was also a college student there. And as sisters often do, you have these incredibly deep conversations of the what ifs. And this particular day, we were talking about what would you do if someone attacked you? If someone raped you, what would you do? Now, my sister's three years younger, but she's also much taller, and she's always been more feisty. And she said, I would scratch his eyes out. I would bite him. I would punch him. I would spit. I would do anything to defend myself. There's no way I'd let him rape me. I'd die first. And I remember thinking, you know, I understand from what I've read, that you have a better chance of survival if you stay very calm. And that conversation came back to me at 3 o'clock that morning. And I remember telling myself, stay calm. Stay very, very present. And those of you who work in the justice field, I'm sure, have come across many women who are victims of, of sexual assaults. And what typically happens is an, you have this out-of-body experience. I mean, it's very painful staying present when someone is assaulting your body. But I had to will myself to stay right there because I knew that it was very important for me to pay attention to what this man looked like. I knew that if I survived, the police officers would have a list of questions. How tall was your assailant? Do you know approximately how old he was? What color was his skin? How tall is he? Do you remember what he was wearing? Did he have any identifying scars or tattoos? What did his face look like? What was the shape of his eyes? I knew those were questions that were going to be asked of me, and those were questions I needed to know. So if you can imagine trying to stare 12 inches away into the face of a man who was getting ready to sexually assault you. But I made myself stay. I tried to memorize the things about his face that I thought would be important. Did he have a missing tooth, perhaps? Maybe he had a pierced ear. How long was his hair? What was the color of his skin? Perhaps there was something in his voice I could remember, something unusual. Maybe he would leave a clue into something he would say that I would be able to tell the police officers. And as he began to rape me, I remember thinking to myself, if I survive, if I get to the police, and if I can identify you, I hope you die. I hope you never, ever experience one moment of freedom. Within about 15 minutes, he 
tried to kiss me, and the revulsion was just huge. I thought I was going to throw up. And he looked at me and he said, relax. And I don't know why this happened. I can't explain it other than I, I feel very confident that there was some larger power working within me. I knew this was my moment. And I said to him, you know, I am really afraid of knives. If you'll take the knife and walk down the front steps of my apartment and drop the knife on the hood of my car and I can hear it clink, I'll let you come back in. I knew space was important for me. And he looked at me and he said, really? And I said, yes, I had him. It was my, my control coming back little bit by little bit. As I got off the bed, I wrapped a blanket around myself in preparation that I would hopefully be able to run free. But I made myself stand close to him because again, I knew how tall was he would be important. Maybe his feet were splayed a specific direction. Maybe they were pigeon-toed or duck-footed. What color were his shoes? Where did his arms hang? Were they particularly long arms? Things I needed to know. He didn't go to the car. He simply dropped the knife, or so I thought, out the front door and came back in and grabbed my arm, and I thought, there's no way I'm going back in that room. I have to go to the bathroom. Can, can I please just go to the bathroom? I needed time. And he said, yes, make it quick. And I went into the bathroom and I began to pray. I don't know what I'm doing. I have no idea what to do here. But I did know that light was something he was avoiding. And light became very important to me that night. So as I came out of the bathroom, I said, can I please go get myself something to drink? I'm really thirsty. And he said, sure, make myself a drink too. We'll have a party. I thought, okay. I needed to get to the kitchen because he had come through the kitchen, so his way in was gonna be my escape route. As I turned the corner into the kitchen, I quickly turned the light on, again knowing that if the light was on, he wouldn't come in there. And I began to make noises with the water and the ice trays and cabinets and drawers as I slowly opened up my back door. And I prayed and I took off running. It had started to rain it was a, a warm, misty rain falling down, and I had not planned where I was going to run to. I had a blanket, no shoes, no plan, no idea where I was going to go. I ended up turning to my neighbor's apartment and began banging, having no idea that he was gone for the weekend. And I turned and looked at my apartment. I saw him coming out behind me, after me, and I took off into the neighborhood. At one point, I actually pinned myself in the corner of a condominium complex, and I looked over to my left and saw a light. And all I knew to do was to run to the light. And as I ran to the house with the carport on, I began banging on the door, and the man came around the corner and he looked at me. It's now 3.30 in the morning, and there's a girl outside in a blanket. And I started screaming, please let me in. I've just been raped, and he's after me. And the man did the only thing I can think any normal, rational person would do at 3.30 in the morning, which was scream. His wife came around the corner and saw me. And she said, oh, God, it's a student at the college. Let her in. I had run to a professor's house. I had no idea. So they let me in, and I fainted. They called 911, and the next thing I knew, the police were there. They began asking me questions. Did you get a good look at the man who assaulted you? Yes, I did. Can you give us a, a, an approximate description of what he looks like? Well, he's about six foot tall, uh, 21, 23, 24 years old, um, African-American man, light complexion, not, not dark, short cropped hair, a, a pencil-thin mustache. He's wearing a navy blue shirt with white stripes on the sleeves and dark pants and canvas-type shoes. And it became very clear that I had paid very close attention to the man who had just assaulted me and raped me. I went to the hospital. As I was waiting for the doctor to come in, he was very annoyed at having to be woken up at 4 o'clock in the morning to come and deal with another sexual assault. I heard a woman crying not far from where I was. The detective came in my room. He introduced himself as Michael Galden. 
And I said, Detective Galden, the woman I hear crying down the hall, is she okay? And what happened to her? And he said, she was just raped. And I said, was it the same man who just raped me? And he said, yes, we think so. She was my mother's age. She lived less than a mile away from my home. He'd broken through her window and sexually assaulted her and beaten her and bitten her. My pain was her pain. We shared this common link that night. We knew what each other was experiencing, that brokenness, that, that moment in time where you know that at 2.30 that morning, I was Jennifer Thompson, a 4.0 student at Elon College, engaged. And I no longer existed. She had died. She was gone. And no amount of time, no amount of therapy would ever bring that girl back to me. She was dead. And I hated him. I, I could taste it in my mouth, that hate, that bitterness, that that rage at another human being. But because I am natured the way I am, I needed to have a job. My job became identifying my rapist. I thought about it every moment. I wanted him caught. I wanted him tried. I wanted him convicted. And had the state of North Carolina had the death penalty for rape, I would have wanted him dead. Over the next few days, I began to put together what my assailant looked like. We did a composite sketch the morning after the rape, putting together which eyes best resembled my attacker, which nose most closely resembled him, what were the shape of his lips, his jaw, his ears, his eyebrows, his eyelashes. And it became clear when the composite sketch was done, that this resembled my attacker. Does this look like the man who raped you, Jennifer? Yes, it does. Are you sure? I'm positive. That looks just like him. The composite sketch ran in the newspaper. Within days, we had a suspect. I came in to do a photo lineup. And sitting with a detective, having been given the instructions to take your time, don't feel compelled to choose anyone, he may or may not be in here, it became clear that he was in there. And I pointed out the picture, and it belonged to a man named Ronald Cotton. Are you sure this is the man? I'm positive that's the man. Days go by, and it leads into a physical lineup. I had never done a physical lineup. My only understanding of a, of a physical lineup was whatever I had seen on detective and cop shows. I assumed I was going to be brought into a room where there would be a one-way mirror and I would be very protected. But of course it didn't happen. The police department was being renovated, so I was taken into a, an abandoned school, into a classroom with a table that divided me and the men in the physical lineup. Again, I was given the same instructions. Don't feel compelled to choose anyone who may or, he may or may not be in here. But of course, why would I be here? Why would I be here if he wasn't in this lineup? It was my job to find him, and I found him. It was number five. It was Ronald Cotton. I knew it. I knew it. I was a good victim. I was a good witness. We began to prepare for a probable cause hearing. It took hours. The judge declared a trial. Ronald Cotton was to stand trial for the rape of Jennifer Thompson. The second woman had not been able to positively identify Ronald Cotton or anyone else, and so therefore I was holding the burden and carrying both of our rapes myself. In January of 1985, State versus Cotton was held in Graham, North Carolina. Who would have ever thought I would be at a trial in a courthouse for my rape. I sat there with my parents on the side of the prosecution. I remember being so amazed about how huge Ronald's family was. There were so many of them. But we all knew that Ronald Cotton had raped me, and they were the, just there to lie for him. We knew that. Two weeks of my life went by, and 
I would look over the defense table and I would see Ronald Cotton sitting there. Never showed any remorse, never showed any fear, complete stone. That was clear. That was the face of someone who was guilty. I had to stand on trial and I had to tell every horrific thing that he had done to me that night while my father and mother cried. I remember looking at Ronald Cotton thinking, I hate you worse than I've ever hated another person in my whole life. I wish you were dead. At the end of the two weeks, Ronald Cotton was sentenced. He was found guilty of first degree rape, first degree sexual offense, first degree breaking and entering, and he was given life in 54 years. It was an amazing day in my life. It was that day that I felt I had deserved. It was owed to me. He deserved what he got. Ronald Cotton was going to prison for the rest of his life, and I was going back to the district attorney's office for champagne. Because this is what justice is. The victim receives the justice. The guilty gets punished, and I could move on, or so I thought. The next semester was just a nightmare. I made my first C in college. My fiance and I couldn't, we couldn't make it. The struggles were just too hard. My recovery was a nightmare. But every night I would go to bed and I remember praying for my mother, my father, my friends, and please God, while Ronald Cotton is in prison, could you please have him killed? But while he's being killed, could you please have someone rape him? I wanted him to know what that moment felt like, what it feels like to have no power and no control over your life, that you don't even get to say what happens to your own body. That brokenness, that spirit and that soul that just dies. And I wanted him to know that. And then I wanted him to die. And this was a daily prayer of mine, every night. In 1987, the appellate court overturned the decision. In their infinite wisdom, they believed that the jury should have known that there had been a second victim and she had been incapable of making an identification. Thus, if she was incapable and maybe made a mistake, perhaps Jennifer Thompson made a mistake too. It was possible, but I knew who I had seen. I knew who had raped me. I knew it was Ronald Cotton. So we went back to court. This time we had to try both rapes. Fortunately, the second victim had had an epiphany. She now remembered. How could you forget? It was indeed Ronald Cotton. It was very clear now. So we headed back to court. Now, Ronald and his defense, of course, were coming up with all kinds of theories one of which that the actual rapist was serving time in central prison with Ronald Cotton. And his name was Bobby Poole. And if I just got a look at him, all of a sudden I would know that I had made a mistake. So under Vordier in 1987, they bring in Bobby Poole, the mystery guy. No, sir, that's not the man who raped me. Jennifer, do you see the man in this courtroom today who did rape you? Yes, sir, he's sitting at the defense table. Are you pointing at Ronald Cotton? I'm pointing at Ronald Cotton. Are you sure? I'm positive. That's enough. Bobby Poole is taken out. Jury never knows he exists. Ronald Cotton is now convicted of two first-degree rapes, two first-degree sexual offenses, and two first-degree rapes, and he is now given a sentence of two life sentences, and off he goes. And again, it's the judicial system at work. It's the way it's supposed to happen. He's never supposed to be a free man. He is never supposed to fall in love. He's never supposed to have the freedoms that we all enjoy, the pursuit of happiness. He will die in prison. And that's what he deserved. Life began to take on a pattern for me. I was working, I got engaged, I got married, I got pregnant, 
In the spring of 1990, I gave birth to triplets. That's not really a pattern, but <laughs> it's my pattern. Um, two little girls and a boy. Oh, it was God's gift to me for having survived. That was my reward. I mean, they were mine. And Ronald was never going to hold his baby because he was never going to find love. He was going to die in prison. This is the way it was supposed to be. Life got crazy, as you can imagine. I mean, the laundry was epic. <laughs> the, the feedings were all the time. They went to school, and my days became overwhelmed with Band-Aids and peanut butter and jelly and stories and crayons and Play-Doh, and, and I loved every moment of it until the spring of 1995 when Detective Galden, who was now captain and the assistant district attorney of Alamance County, came to pay me a wee little visit and told me about this thing called DNA, post-conviction DNA. Ronald wanted a test run. He was still claiming he was innocent, but we knew. You don't have to do this, Jennifer, but your blood sample has disintegrated from the rape kit. You might be court ordered to do it. And I said, listen, we all know that it was Ronald Cotton. I saw his face in my nightmares every single night. Let's do it now. Take the blood now. Do the test now. Because I knew what it was going to come back and show. And it was going to show we'd always known that Ronald Cotton was a horrible monster. And I didn't even sweat it. The blood sample went off to the lab. I didn't think about it. I knew what it was going to show. I couldn't go back to court. I couldn't do another trial. This was my life now, my children. So as I waited, June rolled around. And again, I got another phone call. Jennifer, we need to come and see you. And Captain Galden and Rob Johnson stood in my kitchen and looked at me and said, Jennifer, test her back. And we were wrong. It wasn't Ronald Cotton who had raped you. It was Bobby Poole. Most people like to ask me, well, gosh, dang, Jennifer, how'd that make you feel? What'd you do? What'd you say? I mean, did you faint? Did you, did you scream? No. I just thanked them for their information and wished them a good day because what do you do with that kind of information? My world had now become a snow globe, like somebody had picked up my life and just given a really good shake and then set it down the table and said, here you go. This is your world now. You get to navigate it. During the day, I could, I could function. I knew how to fold laundry. I knew how to make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. I knew how to go to the park. I knew that stuff. I could do it. But at night, when I would tuck those babies into bed and the the house would get really, really quiet, and I was left alone with me. I was suffocating. The shame and the guilt had become enormous. I had never felt shame. I had never felt guilt from being a rape victim. I knew that I was a good person. I knew what had happened to me I didn't deserve. But what do I do with this? What do I say to this man? Surely he hates me. 11 years of his life is gone. It's just gone. And I can't give it back. I can't will it to come back. There's no apology in the world that's gonna, that's gonna be okay. Do I call him on the phone? Do I write him a letter? Don't write him a letter, Jennifer. For God's sakes, don't put anything in writing because people can like sue you. Well, do I call him? Don't call him Jennifer. Listen, Ronald was like treading on that, you know, very scary place in his life when he got arrested. I mean, he wasn't an angel, remember? And they get three hot meals a day in prison. And I hear that they even have internet and computers, and they can get a college education, they get to play basketball, they have gymnasiums. I mean, for God's sakes, 
he probably lived 11 years better than he would have if he hadn't gone to prison. And so think of it this way, Jennifer. He probably lived a longer and better life thanks to you. Well, I thought, gosh, that, that feels kind of good for a second, maybe a second and a half. But I knew that nobody trades freedom. Nobody trades love and family for three hots and a cot. But again, I wasn't going to do anything about it because surely he hated me. Surely he was going to exact revenge on me somewhere down the line. Maybe it wouldn't be me, maybe it would be my children, but I had to be cautious and I had to be careful. In 1996, a man named Ben Loderman found me from Boston. And he came into my house and he said, Jennifer, we're going to do this documentary about the fallibility of eyewitness identification. And somehow my name came up. And he said, Ronald has agreed to, to talk about his story would you be willing to tell yours? And I thought, are you crazy? I mean, people in my neighborhood don't know this. I can't tell anybody what I did. You want me to tell the world on some documentary? No, you're crazy. Mm -mm. Not going to do it. We respect that, Jennifer. Just know that Ronald's going to tell his side of the story. And then I thought, well, gosh, if Ron's going to tell his side of the story, who the heck's going to tell mine? Suppose I look like an idiot. God knows I can't look like an idiot. Okay, I'll tell my side of the story. However, there's a few stipulations here, and that is that Ronald not see me. Like, I don't want to meet him because he will kill me. Is that understood? And they respected that. So as we were putting together this documentary, the film and the light crew would come in and go, saw Ron today, heck of a nice guy. Gosh, gentle, quiet, unassuming, lovely man. And I thought, mm-hmm, this is a setup. He's going to kill me. I can feel it. I'm being set up. No, I don't want to see him. And I didn't until what Jennifer saw aired in February of 1997. And I remember sitting in my den being stunned at my actual words that while I understood the scientific evidence that Ronald Cotton had not been the man who raped me, it was still here. I couldn't get it out of my mind. It was still in my nightmares every single night. What am I gonna do? I can't live like this. So within a month, a private meeting was set up for Ronald Cotton and I, not far from where I'd actually been raped. I remember sitting in this pastor's study what am I going to say? Well, I can't even figure out what to call the man. I can't even figure out if I'm supposed to say, hi, Ronald, or hi, Ron, or hi, Mr. Cotton. I mean, do I? I mean, I don't know. I, I couldn't even get past that, let alone what else I was going to say to the man. And I remember seeing a truck pull up, and this very, very tall African-American man gets out of the truck. And he stands beside his really teeny-weeny wife. And I thought, oh my God, he's too tall. My rapist had not been that tall. How had I not seen that? Why had I not picked up on that? As he came into the pastor's study, I couldn't move. I couldn't physically stand. But I remember looking at him and started to cry. And I said, Ronald, if I spent every second of every minute of every hour of every day for the rest of my life telling you how sorry I am for what happened to you, it wouldn't be enough. It wouldn't come close to how I feel. And Ronald, very lovingly, without hesitation, took my hands and said, I forgive you. I've never been angry at you. It's okay. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of me. I will never, ever hurt you. And we spent the next two hours talking about what had happened, what had life been like, the pains, the, the fears, the, the trauma, the shared trauma of being caught up in a judicial system that sometimes is wrong. 
at the end of that two hours, we ended up in each other's arms. And he looked at me and said, don't look over your shoulders thinking I'm going to be there to hurt you because I won't be there. And we made a promise that afternoon that nothing would ever come between our relationship. We had this shared kinship that is very unique. It's, it's very, I can't even explain it to most people. Except about a year after that, Ronald called me on the phone. I was sitting in my kitchen. My children were sitting at the table knowing darn well that their dad was in the next room. And at the end of my conversation, Ronald says, well, Jennifer, I've got to go. Say hello to your family and know that I love you. And I said, I love you too. And my children looked at me and said, who was that? And I said, oh, that was Ronald. Ronald? Mm -hmm, Ronald? Ronald Cotton? Yes, Ronald Cotton. <gasps> That's really weird. And perhaps it's weird, and perhaps it's deeper than I can, I can even articulate to any of you, but I can tell you that Ronald, that day, in that pastor's study, gave me a gift that he didn't have to give me. But it was a gift that led me to a place where I began to heal for the first time in 13 years. Ronald became my teacher that afternoon on what grace and mercy is. Ronald that day helped me bridge my heart from a place of anger and hate to a place where I could experience joy and peace and love. That journey has taken me through years of telling people such as yourself this story about the need for post-conviction DNA, the need for reforms in our system as it relates to eyewitness identification, as it relates to forensic science. Ronald Cotton gave me a voice back that I had lost so many years ago, July 29th, 1984. Ronald gave me the strength to be before you all today. Um, he's given me a gift that um, is beautiful, and it's Ronald. It's who he is. And so um, I'd like to introduce to you at this moment my very, very dear friend, a man who I truly love with my whole heart, and that's Ronald Cotton. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here before you this morning. I thank NIJ for inviting me here, along with Jennifer and the rest of the crew. Uh, it feels a little strange to look out and see all you all, because it's been a while since I've been in a position like this. Uh, but I just do my best. I've been a little bit under the weather, so just bear with me, and I, I tell you my story. And again, my name is Ronald Cotton. I'm from Burlington, North Carolina, but I live in Mebane. Uh, my story began on August the 1st, 1984. About noon, I had arrived home from a night out with my fiance. And as we was approaching the apartment that I was living in with my mother and boyfriend, um, I got out and threw my shirt over my shoulder because it was pretty warm outside. Uh, as I was approaching the door, he stopped me and he said, Ronald, I said, yeah. Uh, he said, the cops are looking for you. And I immediately asked for what reason. He said, uh, they said you're a prime suspect in a rape that was committed within the community. And I immediately instructed him that I have not committed such a crime. And he said, well, I came in the apartment and took a pair of your shoes, my shoes, and your sister's shoes. Of course, I have eight sisters, but they always let me live at home. And at that time, uh, I said, well, I can't drive my car to the police department because the transmission is out. I said, I'm not going to ride no bicycle because that's my only transportation right now. I said, so therefore, it leaves me with one other option, and that is to go to the neighbor's house, ask her, and hope that she would allow me to use her car to go to the police department. So I walked over to a full 
apartment, and uh, she was outside, you know, sweeping the porch, and I said, Patricia? She said, yes. I said, uh, is it okay if I borrow your car to go to the police department? She said, for what? And I said, well, that crime that had been committed in the community last month, uh, they had me as a prime suspect, and I'd like to go down to the police department and find out what's going on. And she said, sure, make sure you have my car back before 3 o'clock because I have to go to work. I said, well, I'll take one of my sisters with me and let her drive the car back in case they lock me up. Uh, I told my sister, her name is Tootie. I said, Tootie, uh, I said, I'd like for you to go with me to the police department, drive Patricia's car. I said, I want to read the papers and find out what's going on. And they had written out and typed up a paper where whatever the crime had been committed upon Jennifer, I wanted to say, well, look, you have the wrong guy. So anyway, uh, I told my sister, I said, well, let's go by Teresa house. That's the girl I was dating at the time. And when we get over there, you know, she comes out running, crying, saying, Ron, you know, the cops are looking for you. And I said, yeah, I know. I said, I'm getting ready to go down and find out what's going on because I had to commit such a crime. So she gets in the car and we all proceeded on to the police department and we pulled in the parking lot and gets out and I looking up at the building and notice some cops in the window looking out. They recognized me and so they proceeded, you know, like, there he is, let's get him. Um, so I approached the door and as I opened the door, I was introduced by a detective that was on the other side named Detective Golden. And uh, I said, well, my name is Ronald Cotton. I hear y'all looking for me for a crime that I did not commit. That's why I'm here, I'd like to know what's going on. He said, well, come on inside. So we goes upside in a room and I started asking me my whereabouts on July the 27th. I thought he said the 22nd because, you know, at the time, you know, I'm young, you know, I like to get out and have fun and, you know, go to bars, clubs and whatnot at that time. Uh, so, you know, I've been keeping up what I do day to day or whatnot, you know, other than things that I know I needed to, you know, that were responsible for me. So uh, as I told him my story, uh, he left the room, brought another detective in, and I told him my story, but I got my weekends confused, mixed up, and they said that I was lying. So I called in a uniform officer and said, lock him up. I go back, photograph, fingerprinted, and go back in, and uh, I was handcuffed, put it in a patrol car, and taken to the Adams County Sheriff's Department. So I'm down there and I'm thinking about the things that, that they had asked me, you know, uh, you think you missed the big stuff going around town, scrawny, excuse my expression, but white women, uh, but said, but we have your ass. I said, well, look, you can say what you want to say. I did not commit this crime. I said, he said, well, what about this foam cushion from these shoes that was found in Jennifer's apartment? I said, well, I did not do that. I said, that foam was found in her apartment from that shoe. I said, it's a call. You put those, it's formed there. And he said, well, no. So they locked me on up and placed me on the $150,000 bond. And I'm sitting in my cell with my head hung down, you know, trying to figure out, you know, what's going on, you know, uh, what is this, you know, why is it happening? You know, what did I do to deserve such? And finally, uh, as time went by, you know, my family began to bring me cosmetics that I need, you know, deodorant, toothpaste and all that. Uh, legal pads, and so I start taking notes, you know. I said, well, I realized that I made a mistake of my whereabouts. Uh, my alibi was only my family. Uh, I was telling the truth, but they said I was lying. And on uh, August the 26th, 1984, I go to a probable cause hearing, and Jennifer, she was there, she took the stand, told the judge, you know, what had happened what the guy looked like, and she said uh, he had a pencil mustache or dirt one, you know. I felt my blood kind of boil. I said, she's making jokes of me, you know. Uh, but I do understand a crime had been committed upon her, but I had the wrong guy. So on uh, January 16th, 1985, I went to court. I did not take the stand because my attorney said, well, you know, being that I had a past, that they would more like dwell on it. So he had made, asked me to take a list for my witnesses. And being that my girlfriend, she's Caucasian, and Jennifer's, you know, she's white, Caucasian, they said, well, that's going to be a 
strike against you. You don't want that. So I said, well, okay, we'll let it ride. They offered me a plea bargain, a life sentence. I said, well, I'm not taking that. I said, because I haven't committed a crime. The case go to trial. I get found guilty. The judge handed me a life sentence the first day. I go back to the county jail. The guy said, well, how'd you come out, Cotton? I said, well, I got found guilty. I said, I received a life sentence. I said, well, you don't seem to have just received a life sentence. They said, because you're smiling. I said, sure, I'm smiling to keep from crying. You know, I was hurting inside. You know, no one knew that but me. You know, I was walking in those shoes, and I had to deal with what I had to that I didn't want to. But I go back to court the very next day, and I received 54 years. I had the opportunity to use the phone once a week. I called my family, stayed in touch. They was there. They were behind me 100%. But, you know, the table turned. I couldn't give up. I had to be strong. My hair had grew so long, you know, I was plaiting it. And it got practically down to my shoulder. I had a big old afro like you see so many guys nowadays wearing a, no facial hair, and it just wouldn't grow, you know. I, so I had to take a fork that I used to eat my meal with. I saved an extra to use as a comb to do my hair the best that I could. You know, I wasn't trying to be dressed and impressed. I just had to deal with what I had to. And finally, returning back to the county jail, I realized what I had to deal with. I took the time to write a letter to the head jailer because I was getting bored of being in jail. I laid in jail one year. I was getting tense, frustrated. Uh, guys, you know, running their mouth. And I said, well, it's time to make my move. So I wrote my letter. I said, sir, uh, I've been locked up for a crime I did not commit. Uh, I've been to trial, found guilty, and sentenced to the penitentiary. I said, I'm ready to move on, start doing my time, because I had already gotten in a fight in jail, you know, just by the tension and frustration building up. The guy, he said the wrong thing, and I just took it to him. Uh, I told him, I said, if you don't get me out of this jail today, I'm going to start turning apart, you know, because it was building. I'm ready to get on down the road, start serving my time. And so the very next morning, a deputy come to my cell and said, Mr. Cotton, pack your belongings, you're going to prison. So I packed my belongings, handcuffed, shackled, placed in a station wagon, and hit the interstate. Uh, the officer, I told him, I said, I said, you're taking me to a place that I shouldn't be going. I said, because I didn't commit the crime. He said, well, I don't know. I don't care. He said, my job is to get you there. And so, you know, he turned up the radio, and the song was on the radio, Michael Bolton, uh, titled, How, How Can I Live Without You? And so uh, I'm listening to that song, and it touched me. And I'm looking at the vehicles passing by. We're running maybe like 95 miles per hour, heading to the Raleigh Central Prison. And as we get to the destination, I'm looking at these big sliding gates. And I said, well, I guess this is going to be home. I have life in 54 years. The gates slid. We enter. I go in to get shipped down, you know, check for contraband and things. Uh, they handed me a, like a uniform, pant and shirt that matched bed linens and things. And so as I'm entering the hallway to be preceded on to my housing, you know, guys begin to holler, fresh meat, fresh meat. And, and so, you know, I look around and I threw them the bird, you know. And when I get to my housing unit, uh, the officer told me, so well, you be in this room here on belt number 22. So I made my bed, you know, I was feeling kind of bad, you know, knowing I'm in a place I shouldn't have been. And some of the guys approached me, you know, I said, you know, what is your name? Uh, how much time do you have? What charges, you know? And, and at that time, I was in a mood where I didn't feel like talking to anyone. I just wanted to be left alone. And I tell the guys that, well, I said, I don't feel like talking right now. I'm not in a good mood. Please leave me alone. And so I made my bunk and took my pillow, lay back, and, you know, thinking about what had happened, 
where I'm at, how I'm going to deal with what I'm going through, you know. And finally, you know, I kind of began to relax and open up to some of the fellas, you know, knowing that I got to be there. I got to deal with what I got to that I don't want to. But yet still, you know, I'm continue corresponding to and from my attorneys. Uh, couldn't make no phone calls. Uh, I had to fill out a visitation list in order for my family to come and visit me. You know, whether or not it got approved, that was up to the prison system. Uh, I went through processing, and when I used to go to the chow hall to eat, you know, a tray down, you know, that was other inmates putting their food on the tray. And, and it was this one particular inmate, uh, they called him New York, because he was from New York. He was muscle-bound, a uh, old toboggan on his head with holes all in it. Uh, I was, I was a screen being. I weighed 100 and probably 80 some pounds. Uh, but my mother, she always told me she paid me a visit. That uh, she said, "Boy, if you don't soon get out of this jail, you're gonna be looking like a broom handle." You know, cause I was continuing to lose weight. You know, from lack of nutrition, and I went, completed my process, and I said, "Well, I'm gonna get a job in the kitchen." The guy told me he said, "Don't go in the kitchen." He said, "New York said so he's gonna get you." He was talking about New York wanted to rape me, you know, because I was young, slim, no facial hair, big afro, you know, and he thought that was sexy, you know. He'd been in prison for over 10 years, and he was into that type of thing. I, I told him my door doesn't swing that way, you know. And every time I go through the chow hall to put food on my plate, he said, well, we're going to fatten you up, you know. And I knew what he was talking about, you know. I could read between the lines. And finally, um, after I finished my processing, they offered me a job. They said, you can go, either go to the sign plant or the kitchen. And so, you know, being out in society, that's what I did. I used to cook at the Ramadi Inn and then seafood. So um, I said, well, I'll go back to the kitchen. And so they signed me up for the kitchen. Uh, they started me out sweeping, mopping floors, and worked my way up to the dietitian position. And this guy in New York, you know, he come around a lot, you know, running his mouth, you know, you know, what's your name, you know? I said, everybody call me Cotton, 100%. And so uh, he kept on, kept on, you know, hanging around. I got tired of picking up on what I was picking up. And finally, I went into work one day at 4 o'clock. I worked from 4 to 2, 4 a.m. to 2 p.m. And he come to the table. I was at a table by myself, which I mostly hung by myself because I couldn't trust these people, you know. I don't know, they didn't know me, so I wanted to be on the down low. And he come to my table one day and set his tray down and sit and got to talking and I finally feeling come over me. And so I knew what he had on his mind. So I stood up, pushed my tray to the side. And I said, look, I'm tired of you messing with me. I said, best thing you do, get up from this table and leave me alone. And so, you know, he wanted to fight and I told him, let's bring it. And, but a, a lot of the other inmates, you know, separated us. And I didn't have any more trouble out of him saying, you know, he wanted to become associate, but I felt that wasn't the thing to do because I knew what his game was. So I continued on. Uh, I ended up getting in a fight with another guy named Kenny Hammond. Kenny Hammond was a guy that had became friends with Bobby Poole. I was walking down the prison tunnel. I saw a CO escorting another inmate, and I happened to look over, and I recognized this guy, and I said, he looks familiar. So the next day, I was outside playing handball, you know, trying to stay in shape and you know, knowing I got to try to deal with what I got to. Uh, I noticed this guy watching me from a distance. And so I had someone come and take my place. I approached him and I said, excuse me. I said, I said, where are you from? I said, I'm from Burlington. I said, I am too. I said, you kind of look like the drawing of the suspect of the crime that I have me in here, but I, <laughs> I did not. <laughs> and uh, he said, well, I didn't do that. And I said, OK. So I get to thinking back. And I said, well, I recall years ago, uh, I was dating a young lady by the name of Hope. Me and her and her mother were sitting in the den. There was a knock at the door. And Hope's mother said, go to the door. So Hope goes to the door. And I said, well, I'm here to see her. Me and her mom sitting. And now she's at the door. Uh, she's staying too long. So I get something. I go and find out you know, why she's staying at that door too long. Uh, and it was that same guy. I remembered him. I said, OK. That's a guy I saw at the door talking to Hope. I told Hope, I said, look, I'm here to see you. He got to go. So, you know, he left. But anyway, that was the guy that committed the crime. Him and Poole became friends. Kenny, he had been in prison for years. He served 10 years for a rape. 
And all the rape guys that in prison, a lot of them gathered themselves, get together, get their transcripts, and try to see what kind of loophole they can find to get back in court. I mean, even the guilty ones, yet alone the innocent. And so Poole, he had a lot of knowledge of the legal system, and he was trying to help Poole get back in court, and they become real good friends. And so Kenny, at the time, he was calling me red, you know, running his mouth and stuff like that. And I said, well, here I go again. And so I just tell him, I said, leave me alone, please. I said, I don't want any trouble. I said, my attorney told me to keep my nose clean. You know, I have a good sized nose, so, you know, I do try to keep it clean as I could. So uh, Kenny, he approached me one night in the shower, him and two guys. I was washing my hair and I was rinsing the shampoo. I heard the shower curtain slide. Shh. I lift up my hair and I looked out of one eye trying to keep the shampoo out and there was two guys standing there, you know, talking about, oh, you got a beautiful body, you know, and all this and that. And I said, well, look, I don't play those games. I said, please leave me alone. So I didn't want to fight two guys, you know, in the nude. And they finally, I talked enough to defend myself to, to tell them they went their way. So the next day I approached Kenny like a man. I said, look, I said, those games you and your buddies playing, I do not play. I said, Leave me alone. I said, I'm tired of you talking junk about me. And to make a long story short, I ended up fighting Kenny. He was a martial artist guy. You know, he threw a few roundhouses on me that I ducked and stuck him in the throat, you know, because I used to box a lot and worked out in prison and competed with some of the Fort Bragg soldiers. They come on camp and stuff like that. You know, I tried to stay in shape and keep my sound mind and strong mind to hopefully one day that. The good Lord would reveal to, to the attorney, some attorney I, that the miscarriage of justice that had been done upon me and get out. And so uh, I was being transferred through the system. Uh, this guy, Poole, uh, he was on the same unit, uh, slept actually in the same dorm. And I had plans to take his life. My father paid me a visit. And I told him, I said, Dad, I said, look, Poole, he's here. He's confessed to Kenny that he committed this crime upon Jennifer, and I'm serving the time. I said, so I'm a, I'm a doing man. I took, made me a weapon out of a piece of metal out of a desk, took me a shirt, glue, and tape, made me a handle, and I had a weapon probably back that long that I slept every night with it laying across my chest. And when I saw him walking by, I told him, I said, look, when I get a chance, you mind? I mean, I meant that because I was suffering, you know, yet alone, Jennifer, you know. But still, um, my father, he told me, he said, Ron, he said, you know, uh, you say you're innocent. I believe that. He said, but if you take that man life, then that's why you're going to spend the rest of your life. So I went back to my dorm, and I thought about that, laying in my bunk at night with this weapon laying across my chest. They call it a shank. Uh, that's what they call some of you may be familiar with that, but some of them may not. But I said, well, I could take this shank and sell it to another inmate for $40, 50 but no, someone else will get hurt. So I walked in the bathroom and noticed an open drain in the floor, and I, I dropped it down. I listened to it rattle to hit the bottom. And then I got transferred to another prison called Caledonia. It's sort of what, close to Virginia. Stayed there a few years, and they sent me uh, to Hornet County from there. They put me on an airplane at Raleigh Durham International Airport, shackle handcuff, and the plane said Express One. So I looked at that Express One. I said, Well, I guess I'm going one way. And so they transferred me all the way to Mason, Tennessee. I stayed there a year. And in the process, you know, studied right in the courts. And, and so when I noticed this OJ trial going on, this DNA testing, I uh, immediately started getting into it, you know, taking notes. I said, Well, they're trying to say this. DNA testing is 99% accuracy. I said, well, me knowing that I'm innocent, I'm going to request to my attorney to have this test done in my case. So they learned that the evidence still existed because the detective, which was Garland at the time, had funny feelings about the case, put it to the side, and once we learned it still existed, they filed a motion to preserve it to where it couldn't be destroyed. And they done the test, the results come back. The prison warden called me in his office that night. He said, that, um, I said Mr. Cotton, uh, he said that the results come back from your test. The guy committed the crime, has confessed. He said, you're going home tomorrow. But I figured he was telling me a lie. You know, I said, I don't believe that. You know, 
I got life in 54 years, you know, two life, but run concurrent. And so um, he said that uh, you're really going home. So I began to get excited after I was returned to my dorm. I had accumulated a lot of belongings in prison. Um, I started out with $5 and opened up three canteens and dorms. You know, I had guys working for me. Uh, and hate to say, uh, I used to make homemade wine in prison, you know, because uh, <laughs> I mean, I had life in 54 years. I couldn't depend on my family, you know, asking them for their hard earned money. Um, by me being a dietitian, I had access to, you know, the sugar and all that stuff, the yeast. And so I said, well, I'm going to make me some wine. And I started, I had two guys working with me. And we brought the wine out every payday, every time, every payday. We had a line of people waiting in line, a dollar cup, three dollars a pitcher, you know. So we, we looked out for each other, you know. I worked in the kitchen. I, I had the big milk bags, you know, to make the stuff in. We get the chicken boxes and get it to fit the bag and the heat system around the wall. We put the wine in there, let it cook for three days, go back, check it, and add a little more yeast or sugar, whatever needed. And it didn't take long, you know. Guys walking around, you know, all feeling good, you know. And I hate to say, you know, some started fights and all, but we kind of like looked out for each other, you know, see a guy, and we wanted to see old come. We always had somebody out watching and hollered the man down and everybody running like they're playing cards. Cause at Central, you know, I, I dug a hole in the ground with a stick and put a bubble gum bucket in the ground and took me a magazine and a deck of cards out and a blanket. If I see the officer coming, you know, I'd take him, cover it up with the plastic, take my blanket covered I, like I'm playing cards. And when he turned his back, how you doing, Cotton? Doing pretty good. And he make his round, you know, I'm, I'm still mixing, you know. But that day, when it all came to an end, I, I couldn't believe it. I went back to the dorm and all my belongings that I had guys selling for me, I, I just issued it out like it was candy, you know. And I told him, I said, well, I'm going home tomorrow. And, you know, I used to rent out radios, a dollar, 50 cent a night. I sell snack bags, I get a pint of milk, an apple, or a juice. Or, Five dollars a week, every day, you know, that was a snack at night. Cause I was a dietitian, you know, I tried to make money, you know. And that morning the officers come by and I packed my bag, they took me to a room and I said, well, I'm leaving. But yet still, they wanted to see what I was taking out of the prison. So they went through my belongings again, you know, scraped me down and, you know, done the whole works. and. I get in a car and they drive me from Mason, Tennessee, all the way to Alamance County. But in the process, they said, have you eaten at McDonald's lately? I said, no, I haven't had a burger, a real burger in a while, you know. And so we stopped at McDonald's. They took me out, sat at a table. And I was still handcuffed and ate my French fries and drank and enjoyed it. And going on to the county jail, you know, made it to our destination. They were circling the courthouse. I said, well, this is the courthouse. I was sentenced, but I didn't know they had built a new one. So we get tired of going around the courthouse, and finally they stopped the deputy that was crossing the road, and he said, well, that's a new courthouse. So I go in the back way, and they take me in the room. I'm still in prison clothes, a white pant, white T-shirt with a blue collar, and I'm waiting on them to take the handcuffs off, the, but the lady wouldn't. She said, well, you're not in our custody. You're in the custody of the DOC, not the Alamance County Sheriff Department. So I'm standing there, and my family came to bring me some civilian clothes, and the judge got off the bench, and he gave her a direct order to take the handcuffs off. She did. I changed clothes, and I walk out in the courthouse and look in the courtroom, and all the media, you know, cameras set up, and the DA he read out the charges and call them out, and my defense attorney they were sitting there, and the judge he said, "Well, Mr. Cotton, the charges that are against you." are now being dropped and you are a free man. And everybody hugging, crying, and family's all there. And so I had two of my nephews to take my bag. I walked outside and I looked up at the sky and I said to myself, free at last, but where do I go from here? You know, it was like tossing a baby out in the world that had been, you know, lost for years. So, you know, I, I knew I had to learn to crawl before I walked. And so I said, where do I go from here? And my sister, she said, Ron, uh, she said, you can come and stay with me till you get on your feet. So I stayed with her for eight months. I worked two jobs, cooking in the restaurant and making yeast rolls at Golden Corral and saving my money and helping her and 
putting money back for a vehicle. And, but actually, my first job was with Lab Corp, which the lab that done my DNA testing in Elon. They offered me a job. Uh, I had another job offer to put muffles on cars. I, I like tingling with cars. I still do today. And I was going to take that job. But my lawyer, he said, no. He said, take, don't get that job. And so I took the lab job, worked out three years, and quit. And, you know, and the money was getting better, better opportunities. And so, you know, whenever they, I had an opportunity to make an extra dollar, I'd leave that job, go to the other one, you know. I know I probably could have stayed for the benefits, but, you know, I was trying to get on my feet quick and fast, you know, and do it the right way. Uh, I met my wife, actually, at Lab Corp in the break room. I was sitting in there eating with a, another female, and I noticed she walked by, and I, I looked, and I said, hmm, that's, that's nice right there, you know. <laughs> and finally, you know, uh, the female that was eating with me, I didn't know that she worked the same lab with her, so she goes back and tells her what suggestion I said about her. You know, it wasn't that bad, you know, just a compliment on her parents. And so uh, the next day, I go to the break room, and she was in there. Her name was Robin, by the way, uh, and Brenda, they were sitting there. And so I goes over, and I talk, and I asked her out, and she agreed. But I held back because, you know, I didn't, I didn't have any driver's license or no vehicle, and I didn't want to really go out with a female, and I didn't have no transportation. You know, I didn't want to borrow someone else. I wanted my own stuff, you know what I'm saying? So I got my car on the road, and I waited two months, and I went back and asked out, and she, she agreed. We goes out and have a good time, and things worked out. We ended up getting married, and we have a 11-year-old little girl who will be this year. Her uh, name is Raven, and that's where I am right today. And, and you know, I end up getting up with Jennifer. And, you know, we do our thing, you know, going out speaking and forgiving one another for the right reason. You know, there's no reason for me to hold a grudge at Jennifer because of the mistakes she made. You know, we're human. We all make mistakes. And you have to learn to live and forgive and move on. You know, we may not forget. I mean, since this has come to surface, uh, Jennifer, you know, she's been an inspiration to me as well as me to her. I, I met her family. She's met my family. We all get along, and that's the way it should always be, you know. And that's my story. If anybody, um, yeah, if you want to spend maybe five minutes or something like that, if there's anybody has any questions or anything of that nature for them, it's such an extraordinary story. It's amazing. Anybody? Question in the back? Yes. The question is whether there's any DNA evidence from the other rape that night. Is um, that on? Is, is that this on? on? Is this on? Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, there was, as a matter of fact, that was the DNA that was tested. Um, my DNA, uh, the, my rape kit um, did not have any um, sperm that could have been, it, it was masked, I guess, with some blood, ty blood typing. So the, the DNA that was actually tested that night was from the second rape um, kit, and there was actually just a fragment of a sperm head that had survived. So it was really quite miraculous that we had any to test at all because 11 years had gone by. And obviously, when it was collected in '84, there wasn't as much information on how to collect it and preserve it as we have today. So um, that was the the DNA, and we knew that it had been committed by the same person. Um, and eventually, he did. Bobby Poole did confess that he had committed. Um, both of those rapes, and he was in prison at that time serving for six other rapes. Yes. Mary Lou?
help or information? Um, I don't know that I, I'm, I've always been, as you could probably tell by me talking, I'm kind of a, a strong personality. So I don't usually ask for help, which is one of my worst character traits I have. Um, as far as information, you know, I, I did a lot of, um, my background was in science, so I understood the scientific relevance of a DNA test versus, you know, human memory. So I, I understood it. Um, through the months, you know, we spent a lot of time, I would, talk, I would call Mike Galden or different people, and they, they always filled me in on information. Like, they, they weren't the kind of people who just kind of dropped a bomb on me and then walked away and f with my aftermath, you know, for me to deal with. So they were, we had one of those really unusual cases that everybody working within our case really were amazing people. So um, I didn't feel like a lot of the victims that I talk to now feel that they're not getting information and no one's, you know, no one's helping them sort through the system. There's a question. You're welcome. Can I, if I can ask Mr. Cotton something I, uh, that really is, uh, I'm very curious about, and that is your friends and family. I mean, do, do, did people at the time and since express to you feelings about, you know, cynicism about the police, about the justice system as a result of what happened to you? I mean, what, what, I mean, what do they reflect to you about your situation? They must feel like a great injustice was done, and they feel like it's something bigger than just your case, or, or how, how do you feel about it, and how do your friends and family feel about it? Well, my friends and family, you know, they stuck by me from the beginning. Uh, and now, after war, that this situation has surfaced, and, you know, I'm a free man now, you know, they're very, very happy. Uh, I can't really say what they actually feel because they didn't really express themselves other than knowing that I'm free at last. No more shackles, and I'm glad, you know. Uh, I just have to move on. Uh, you know, occasionally they may ask me a question pertaining to Jennifer, you know, especially, you know, my daughter. Uh, she asks me questions all the time, you know, why did this happen, why did that? And so, you know, I have to take time to explain and express myself to her because, see, I had to walk in those shoes, and even though there are many out there that know this case and story, that they may try to tell things different, you know. Yeah. And so I prefer for her to hear from the horse's mouth, which is me, you know. And my family, they don't really say anything about it other than, you know, they're just glad. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you very, very much. Thank you very, very much.